So it's a smaller group, and I, I'm using the mic just because I think this is being recorded, so, but if I yelled loud enough, you could probably all hear me. <clears throat> and you've got me for the next hour or so, and it is a one-man band today, so um, I'd like this to be a little bit more interactive, so I am going to wander around, I am going to call on people, um, <laughs> especially people who, sh who shake their head that way. Um, <laughs> And, and lastly, I should say, I, I do hope we can be interactive. You know, I think these are much better uh, presentations and programs when there are questions and comments and we can have some fun with it. So I also note that everybody is sitting at least four rows back. I feel like I'm back at university or something and uh, everybody's afraid. So let's get started. Uh, I'm John Sabloni. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a partner at Nixon Peabody, splitting my time between Boston and New York. Um, I chair the firm's private fund dispute practice, which um, for purposes of this group means that I litigate uh, and work out uh, hedge fund, private equity, and all, any type of alternative fund disputes. Um, I, don't, I don't leave that slide up to dwell on it, I just put it up there to show you I actually do have a little bit of experience in this area. Probably not as much as uh, um, I'm going to talk about today, but a good, good fair amount. Uh, as for the firm, I won't bore you with all the firm slides other than to say we are in some of the major markets, particularly in the northeast of the U.S., on the west coast, and then also in London and Hong Kong. Um, so we have the capability to handle um, uh, pretty much any matter in, in the uh, United States. So what I want to do today is, I was thinking about how to put this presentation together, and you know, I think all of us remember when Madoff blew up. Um, it was a very dark time, at least for my practice and my, my experience, because we got calls, calls started pouring in from everywhere, um, primarily uh, from individual investors who one minute thought they were worth, you know, uh, seven, eight, nine figures, <laughs> and then the next minute were penniless. I mean, calls from literally folks saying, I can't, I can't pay my tax bill, my real estate tax bill, because I don't have any money, what should I do? Uh, calls from offshore funds, feeder funds, saying, we don't know what to do because the entire fund doesn't, is gone because we were a feeder fund. Or we were a fund of funds and now, you know, 20 or 30 percent of our, um, our invested capital has suddenly disappeared, what do we do? It was a really dark time. And it, it, the, the, the ensuing years of litigation have not been easy for a lot of folks. But there is a silver lining, and I did want to, that's what I'm going to focus on today, which is when we began giving, when I began giving these talks 10 years ago, you know, we would talk about certain types of issues, and we had no baseline in terms of U, the U.S. legal system to really discuss them. You know, in the securities context, if you think about it in the U.S., we've had 60 years of case law and statutory law that grew up around the securities system. It's a very mature system. You may disagree with some of the cases, you may think it's overregulated. you may think that the plaintiff's lawyers uh, have too much power, but at least you pretty much know what you're getting. Uh, in the private fund space, hedge fund, private equity, any private fund uh, that's not considered a security, a regulated security, we didn't have that type of case law. You know, we didn't know how to deal with things like redemption freezes. We didn't know how to deal with things like liquidity crunches and lack of liquidity in funds. We didn't know how to deal with things like net asset value that doesn't match true market value. And as a result, um, when, when these issues came into focus, nobody really knew what the legal system, how the legal system was going to handle it or what the game plan was to handle those types of disputes. Madoff sort of gave us the opportunity to litigate a lot of these issues. And so today, a number of years later, we do have some guideposts. And I would argue that the, the industry is actually maturing because of those guideposts, and we have some sense of what it is um, the, the courts and the legal system are going to do. So if we think back to before 2008, um, first of all, the SEC had virtually no resources dedicated to private funds or Ponzi scheme issues. Um, I remember... <laughs> Sitting at a conference in New York City, probably circa 2006, 2007, and there were like three or four people in the back row just kept their head down and would not identify who they were or talk about anything. And they were from the SEC. And the SEC at that point was just trying to learn what's up with this hedge fund stuff. You know, how do they work? What are the angles? How, does, how, how, do, we have to, how, do, we, how do we get involved and try to regulate them? You know, this was right around the time of the, the so-called hedge fund rule that the SEC had to deal with. 
Um, they, 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 were, they were basically trying to regulate hedge funds. They couldn't do it because the courts ruled that a fund, a hedge fund is one client essentially. The fund itself is the client, not every investor in the fund. So the SEC had a very, very limited role and frankly knew almost nothing about these funds. Um, we had very few claims, everybody remembers this, by private litigants. Why would there be any claims? The market only went one direction. <laughs> up, 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 right? I mean, I remember doing um, pension fund conferences and people were clamoring for how much more capital. They didn't want to put 5% into alternative funds. They wanted to put 20% into alternative funds. They didn't care about the fee structure or what it all meant. They just wanted those returns to bolster those, those pension funds. And so there weren't any claims by private litigants because when people make money, they don't bring lawsuits, at least not normally. Um, and nobody knew what the heck CIPIC was, <laughs> right? Anyone know what CIPIC was seriously before the Madoff debacle? No. Yes, I one. Okay, we you know, but one out of fifty. You know, it, it, it's Sipa and and Sipic were not household names. Um, they simply were not, and there was almost no case law. Um, the case law that existed was in the U.S. anyway is limited partner case law, limited partnership case law. Um, the way I got involved in this industry was we handled, uh, you know, for for years and years and years, for twenty years, handled, you know, um, syndicated. Um, syndicated partnership disputes. So they, we were dealing with the limited partnership structure. And there is obviously limited partnership law that's grown up over the years, but there had never been any case law addressing how, limited partner, how the limited partnership structure would apply to the types of funds that we've seen in the last 15 or 20 years that have popped up. From the hedge fund to the private equity to the you know, real estate investment, REIT, all the rest. We didn't have any types of cases that dealt with those disputes. Then we hit 2009. And the credit crisis comes, as we all know. And what do we have? I'm going to talk about this a little bit. We have a lack of liquidity for the most part. All of a sudden, funds are beginning to dry up and liquidity is frozen. And it impacted even the healthy funds at the time. Because if you think about it, if I'm a healthy fund, if you're invested in me healthy fund and you're invested in five other funds that are illiquid, well, you need to get cash from somewhere. And so you're going to take that cash from the healthy funds. And when you take that cash from the healthy funds, you immediately make that fund unhealthy. So it's like a contagion that spreads, not just from the, to the bad funds, but also to the good funds. All of a sudden, we saw all this increased pressure. The regulators started getting involved, the bankruptcy trustees started getting involved, individual investors, institutional investors began to suddenly crack open these fund documents, which none of them had ever read, ever, right? Who's, who's, name, give me one institutional investor who sat down with a PPM or a limited partnership agreement and read it before they signed it. I had one client one time before 2007 ask me a question about what was in a limited partnership agreement they were going to sign, institutional client, and I said, this is really bad for these reasons, you shouldn't sign it, and they said, if I don't sign it, I can't get in the fund and I really want to be in the fund, so they signed it. I mean, so nobody was paying attention, nobody cared what was in there. And as a result, <laughs> Madoff has spawned an industry. You know, we now talk about things like clawback disputes. We talk about the funds and the feeder funds being caught in the middle. Um, we talk about the fact that our, the investors, both European and US institutional investors, no longer shy away from litigation, and that there are now third party claims. I, I just put this up there to say this was not the norm. If you think back 10 years ago, there really was sort of an old boy network among the financial institutions. Big banks and brokerage houses and institutional investors did not sue each other. They did not. That was plaintiff's work. That's what those greasy plaintiff's lawyers did. The, the, the big banks did not engage in that. 2007, 2008 changed the landscape forever. I mean, I've got cases now where, you know, large, large institutions are the plaintiffs in cases suing my clients, you know, huge mutual funds, huge insurance companies, large banks, big institutional investors coming in as plaintiffs against other large institutional investors. And some of them are on both sides because a lot of the big financial players are both investors in funds and then have created their own funds. And so they are both plaintiffs and defendants in these cases. I think that's one of the huge takeaways from the last number of years is that the stigma of litigation among the large financial players is over. 
they are not afraid to sue anymore because they realize that they owe fiduciary duties and obligations to their investors. So big, big, big difference in terms of what people, what these institutions are willing to do. And those claims, by the way, extend to third parties. <laughs> They're not afraid to sue their law firms anymore. God help us all. I mean, you've all seen the press, right? Every law firm, including my own, gets sued whenever a fund goes bad. Um, they're not afraid to sue the auditors and the accountants. They're not afraid to sue the administrators and the fund managers. And they're certainly not afraid to sue the insurance carriers and others. So, you know, once those claims start, they're hard to stop. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about, you know, how successful they've been and, and how willing some of those players and actors are to settle cases. But those claims didn't exist in this context 10 years ago. So what happened really? So it started really with the bankruptcy trustees and the, the liquidators. And they started suing the fund managers for fraud and breach of fiduciary duty. They started suing the professionals, myself not personally, but law firms included for malpractice and, and conspiracy. Uh, and the investors were subject to and also on the other side of clawback claims. And I want to talk about that for a minute, because the investors really are in a unique position here, right? If you're the investor whose, whose money is trying to be clawed back, you are not a very happy camper. But if you are the investor in a fund, in a Ponzi scheme, and they're trying to claw back other people's assets, suddenly you're in a much better position than you might otherwise have been. Um, I'll, I'll tell a little bit of a funny story. I don't know if, how many people know Peter McMaster. He's a QC at Appleby. Uh, and came in, and he recently authored a Law 360 article comparing the Ponzi scheme law in the U.S. to Ponzi scheme law in Cayman. I thought I would never see a Cayman practitioner say that the U.S. legal system makes so much more sense on any issue whatsoever, but Peter managed to, to say that, and I, I sent him an email congratulating him on his conversion um, uh, in, in such matters. But the reason is what U.S. law tries to do, and we'll get into this in a bit, is put everybody back in the position they would have been. It, it, it tries to, it assumes, of course, that the Ponzi scheme is exactly that. It is a fraud. And therefore, it shouldn't be, you know, whoever's sitting in the last chair. It's not musical chairs. <laughs> it should be that everybody is treated fairly. So if I happen to get out early or take assets out early, I shouldn't be treated any differently than somebody who stayed in the fund because we all believed it was a valid fund. So in the US, if you just think about it, what we try to do is treat everybody fairly and treat everybody as if they equally contributed and got equal amounts out. Whereas in other jurisdictions, including Cayman, you know, when you get out makes a big difference. Um, we saw the offshore liquidators seeking Chapter 15 status. <laughs> Chapter 15, another provision of the bankruptcy code not many people knew about <laughs> before you know, 2008. Um, very underutilized provision that now is uh, top of mind on every liquidator and bankruptcy trustee's mind. Um, private investors started to bring civil suits. Um, many of my clients did the same. Again, large institutional clients that would never have thought about being plaintiffs in, in litigation suddenly decide, oh, I think I want to bring a lawsuit, you know, sea change. And of course, the SEC finally got out of their own way and figured out what hedge funds were and what these funds were. And they started to bring civil claims against fund managers as well. Now, the SEC had very limited jurisdiction because, again, the, a lot of the hedge funds were not subject to SEC regulatory jurisdiction. But here's what happened. Prior to uh, the Goldman case, if you get folks remember, the SEC tried to regulate hedge funds. And a lot of the funds, a lot of the funds registered with the SEC because they thought they were subject to their regulatory approval. Case comes down thereafter saying these funds are not subject to regulatory authority because there's only one investor and that's the actual fund. So case law strikes down the SEC's hedge fund rule. But a lot of the funds forgot to deregister with the SEC. You can voluntarily submit yourself to SEC regulatory jurisdiction. And once they registered, they did. And some funds stayed purposely registered as a marketing ploy. I'm an SEC registered fund. It's a stamp of approval, right? But now, it's a, it's a different case now, but I'm saying in 2008, 2007, that's what happened. And, and so why is the SEC able to regulate or bring claims in 2007, 2008? You're always subject to the fraud rule, but you have to have, there still has to be jurisdiction. The SEC still has to have 
jurisdiction over that asset class. You can't just bring, the SEC, if I have a private transaction, it's not subject to the SEC's authority, the SEC doesn't have that right. Private investors would have the right. The criminal authorities would have the right. But I'm talking about civil enforcement actions. And so, <clears throat> yes, you're right about, by the way, you're right, of course, you're right on the criminal context, you're absolutely right. I'm talking about civil enforcement. So, SEC starts bringing these claims because a lot of these funds were registered. And what they would do is they'd say, oh, you're in a registered fund. And the SEC would knock on the door and say, I'm going to do an examination. <laughs> and suddenly it would all begin to unravel. So the SEC actually played a very large role in the lead up uh, through 2007, 2008, because of the fact that a lot of these funds still were, had registered and did not deregister. Again, some because they felt it was a stamp of approval and they wanted to market to their investors that they were SEC approved, and some because they just didn't realize they had to deregister before. Um, and so what have we seen le recently? We've seen large settlement on clawback claims. We've seen the investor litigation is still proceeding, uh, still going on, still going strong. Um, the, the fund documents have turned out to not be quite the bar to the proceedings here in the U.S. as some thought. I'll talk a little bit about the distinctions, but if you look at some of the Cayman and BVI-based funds, the offshore funds, the fund agreement basically gives the investors zero rights. And, and as a practical matter, a Cayman or BVI court would enforce that. But if you could find a way to get those disputes in the U.S., most U.S. judges will look beyond the fund documents. That's the question. Go ahead. Correct. I'm saying if, if, in terms of the U.S. courts, they look much more askance at the exculpatory clauses that are in these agreements than a Cayman or BVI court would. Now here's where it gets really interesting and tricky. The, the agreements, even if you can find a hook into the U.S., and we'll talk about this, the agreements still, still allow for the application of Cayman law. So in theory, a state court judge sitting in New York should be applying Cayman law. In practice, U.S. judges are so trained to look beyond, in some respects, the actual terms of the agreement and to not enforce exculpatory clauses that they're loath to do it. And you're much more likely to find a judge in the U.S. who will find a public policy exception or reason around some of these clauses than you will in Cayman. And then the other thing I want to talk about the Europeans, you know, the U.S., of course, was quick to start litigating. And the Europeans were, were behind the eight ball for a long time. And I thought it was instructive. About a year ago, we did two conferences, two zombie fund conferences. We did one in New York, <clears throat> and we did one in London. And in New York, the, 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 the institutional crowd didn't want to talk about litigation anymore. They wanted to talk about third party um, acquisition of distress funds. You know, they wanted to come in, and they, wanted to, they basically wanted to create a market, and have created a market in distress funds. You know, it's typical New York. We've litigated enough, now we want to make money. Um, so we ended up spending most of the conference talking about distress funds and, and, and the players out there that will buy into distress funds. Go over to London, nobody wants to talk about buying into distress funds. They realized they missed the wave of litigation, and all they wanted to talk about was, how do I litigate and get my money back? So I think the, the, the European and UK market was probably a couple of years behind the U.S. in terms of litigation strategy, but in the last, I'd say, 12 to 18 months, they've caught up. Uh, there, there's much less reticence, just like there's much less reticence among the big banks and institutions here in the U.S. to litigate, there's a lot less reticence in the EU and U.K. than there used to be uh, to litigate simply because they understand that huge amounts of assets have been recovered and they've been left out of that. So that's a sea change, I would, I would argue, as well. Um, I throw the Madoff Victim Fund up there. I'm not going to talk about it a lot, but there are other avenues available for some of these um, problems, including in Madoff, and the Victim Fund is one. I think the Victim Fund is going to be, if you want to look forward, a, a huge area for, li for litigation in the future, because what the Madoff Victim Fund has said is we're not going to pay the intermediaries. Um, if you lost money in Madoff, you have to be the ultimate beneficiary. So, for example, a feeder fund is not going to be allowed to recover under their rules under the Madoff Victim Fund. What the Victim Fund assumes is that the you know, pensioner in Germany is going to come and make a claim, which is never, ever going to happen. The reality is the pensioner in Germany you know, put money into a pension fund, which invested into a German bank, which invested into a BVI hedge fund, which invested into Madoff. And so, as a practical matter, 
I think there are going to be lawsuits as this begins to play out among the intermediaries, the feeder funds and others saying, you can't draw an arbitrary rule that says you're not going to pay me simply because I'm an intermediary because I was the ultimate investor in Madoff. If you're a feeder fund, you're the investor. The pensioner is, you know, five steps down the chain. So I think we are going to see some litigation around that. So let's talk about the three issues and then I'll start talking about actual cases. Issue one, uh, I call it the three-legged stool, redemption freezes. Um, we still have hedge funds that have been locked up since 2007, 2008. Now, there's nothing in the fund agreement that says they can't be locked up forever. But I think everybody would admit and agree that the intent of these documents was never that redemption freezes would be in place for you know, the better part of a decade. That, that's not what we were dealing with. That's not what anybody anticipated. So the argument by a lot of the fund managers that, you know, I'm allowed to do this, yes, you are allowed to do this, but the concept was to put up a, a, a block on redemptions in order to avoid the proverbial run on the bank. It wasn't meant to shield you from your fraudulent NAV um, um, calculations for five, ten years. So the redemption freeze has been huge. The funds, a lot of these funds are still locked up. They can't attract new capital because if the gates are up, nobody's going to invest in those funds. They can't get out of the positions they're in because the positions are either illiquid or frankly were never worth what the NAV statement said they were worth. So it looks like a fire sale if you begin to sell them off. And the fund documents do give unlimited discretion to the fund managers, but you know, as a practical matter, we're so far beyond now the argument that I'm allowed to keep doing this that this issue has spawned a ton of, of, of not only litigation but workout. And I'll talk about the workout area a little bit later, but one thing we're able to do, at least in the U.S., is put pressure on the funds. It's not all about recovering money. Sometimes the goal for litigation, or at least to put pressure and leverage on some of these funds, is to get, an, get a workout plan. Let's get a controlled wind down. Let's, let's, let's have some transparency into the fund, which we might not otherwise have given the fund documents. So we've used the redemption freezes uh, although the fund managers have used them, obviously, to, to shield redemptions, we've been able to use them as leverage to say, we need more transparency. If you want to keep the gates up, we need to know more about the fund. We need to know more about what the underlying assets are. We have to know what your plan is to liquidate them. We have to know what they're really worth, regardless of what the NAV statement says. The second leg of the stool is, is net asset value. Um, I don't know. I, when I went to law school, they taught me that fair market value is what a willing, what a willing um, buyer would pay to a willing seller, neither under any compulsion to buy or sell. I'm not an accountant. I'm not an auditor. I'm certainly not a consultant. But that's not what NAV is. And so as a result, we've seen this, this wide run-up in NAV. Now, when you think about a hedge fund structure, it's not surprising because of the 220 fee structure. Right? I have every incentive as a fund manager to get that NAV as high as I can. Because I'm going to get 2%, I'm going to get 20% of the upside, but I'm going to get 2% of the overall value of the fund. So the higher the NAV, uh, the better off that I am. And so that has resulted in a lot of sort of bad, I would say bad behavior uh, when it comes to NAV. The problem is that the liquid, the available cash, the liquidity is often used up to pay the 2% upside in any given year. And then once you hit this high water mark, the fund managers lose interest. Meaning once I can't run the NAV up anymore, I'm really, there's no more cash, I've got an illiquid fund. I really can't take my 2% because there's no, there's no upside. And I really aren't getting anything out of the fund anyway because it's lost liquidity. So as a result, there's really nothing the manager wants to do. They become what we've called zombie funds. They sit there. And this is the other side of the redemption piece, right? You put up the gates, but there's also no way to get the fund out of trouble because no one's going to invest. And as a practical matter, the fund manager really has no interest in doing anything with the fund. And this has resulted in investors losing confidence in those NAV calculations. And now today, if there's one lesson to take away from the last few years, it's clients when they invest in funds are much more focused on NAV. You know, how is it calculated? What are the rules around it? What do the fund documents say? They tend to still say that you can calculate it pretty much any way you want, but the, the investors, the institutions are paying much more attention to how NAV is calculated. And then lastly, the third, the third leg of the stool is liquidity and liquidity risk. You know, we talked about the, the contagion spreading to even the safe haven assets. Um, the, the issue, this is the way I think of it, illiquidity in these funds have had the effect of transferring what should be open-ended funds 
into um, closed funds. You know, most of these investors thought that they were investing in open-ended funds. I can get my cash out essentially whenever I want. Yes, there are certain dates and there are, you know, requirements as to when you have to make your redemption request, but they thought they were entering into open-ended funds, and the reality is these are now closed funds. And we've said to a lot of the managers, look, you basically, if you put up the gates, you have no liquidity. You're basically running a closed fund. And you can't continue to run your closed fund as if it's an open fund. You can't. And so the, this piece of it, the, the liquidity risk, has also resulted not only, in, again, in litigation, but in some leverage to institutional investors to try to gain some concessions, whether it be transparency or a, a controlled wind down. I promise cases. <laughs> my least favorite part of doing this. I'm not, a big, I'm not a big case law fan, but let's talk about them. And you know, there are folks in the audience who know a lot more about some of these cases than I do. I've been involved in some, but not all, and others have been involved in a bunch. I, I just wanna flag the, um, the morning miss case, because this really is what I would say started it when the Second Circuit found that, and this is one of the Fairfield Century cases, that, Fairfield, that Century had its center of main interest um, within the meaning of Chapter 15 in the British Virgin Islands. Um, doesn't seem that remarkable to us today, but there was a lot of litigation leading to this point. Um, being able to argue that your center of main interest is in the BVI, you know, opened the door to real Chapter 15 protection for a bunch of the offshore funds. And I would say this case is really the critical one coming out of probably the most important circuit court uh, with respect to these types of disputes. And obviously, uh, center of main interest is critical. Um, because it triggers the automatic relief for the bankruptcy code. And the key to it was that, you know, the, the, the Comey is determined at the time of the entity files its bankruptcy petition, and what the court is supposed to do is examine all of the internal and external documents. And as a practical matter, in most cases, the automatic stay will result. And the, this, this decision, you know, it, it's consistent with the law, it's consistent with the bankruptcy code required, and it also set a very narrow uh, exception to this, this public policy exception. You know, I talked earlier how U.S. courts and judges love to ignore the law and go with public policy. In, in this case, that, that exception was very narrowly tailored. And so, given the Second Circuit decision, you know, the, the Chapter 15 is a real, real, real option um, for a number of funds who otherwise in the past were afraid to go the Chapter 15 route, or at least try. Um, the other big case, and all these cases have come down in the last couple of years, uh, is Weavering. The folks here I know are very familiar with Weavering. Um, here we've got fund liquidators um, bringing, derivative, bringing actions against the directors for failing to discover that a counterparty to an interest rate swap was a related party. Now this is a Cayman court decision. I don't pretend to be an expert on Cayman court law, but I put this up to show, again, the distinction between the way courts in Cayman look at the world and the way some of the courts in the U.S. look at the world. Uh, the Grand Court of Cayman Islands found the directors liable, and the, the, the standard was willful neglect or default. Um, the Cayman Island Court of Appeals reversed. And what the Cayman Court said, the Court of Appeals said, it agreed that the directors had breached their duty to supervise, but disagreed that evidence supported the finding of willful neglect or default. And therefore, it reaffirmed, in my view, the willingness of the Cayman courts to uphold these exculpation clauses we were just talking about. If there's ever been a case that sort of sets the Cayman standard, this is it. And if you are, if you are a director in Cayman, you are, you know, this decision gives you a lot of protection. But if you're an investor, um, this gives you a lot of pause. Because it becomes almost impossible to prove the standard necessary um, to hold anybody liable if the fund uh, runs into trouble. So huge, I put Weavering up there just to show the dif difference between the way the U.S. approaches these issues and the way some of the offshore jurisdictions do. Um, let's talk a little bit about Madoff. Um, this was a key decision out of the Southern District uh, just about a year ago. And in, in this particular Madoff decision, what happened is the investors were arguing with the trustee over the standard required to show good faith. Um, and it's become crystal clear now that good faith means that the transferee neither had actual knowledge of the fraud nor willfully blinded himself or herself to the circumstances. Why does it matter? It matters because this case established the fact that the burden is on the trustee 
to allege lack of good faith by showing willful blindness to the truth. That is critical. Now, we have a new issue that's popped up, which is this, this standard is in the pleading phase. And now the next issue that's come up is whether that burden, who, who's, who does that burden rest with at the actual trial? And that's another issue that will be litigated eventually. But the other thing this case did is we saw Judge Rakoff you know, really criticize Irving Picard and say you know, that the trustee's maneuver was in a fashion that the court has learned is typical of the trustee's litigation strategy. So let's talk a little bit about Picard and Rakoff. Um, you know, Irving Picard, I know him, I know a lot of folks in this room know him. Uh, honorable guy, good, has done amazing work. I mean, nobody could disagree that what, what, what Picard has done for the Madoff estate uh, over the last few years has been nothing short of phenomenal in terms of the assets recovered. Phenomenal. Nobody predicted it. At the same time, with phenomenal results, you, you typically ruffle a few feathers. <laughs> and some feathers have been ruffled. Um, the key here, for those who don't understand the system, is the bankruptcy court handles bankruptcy-related issues. But when you get into litigation around ancillary issues, the, the, the defendants in those cases have the right to have those disputes heard in front of a um, district court judge. Uh, Article three, United States District Court Judge. Um, who is you know, appointed by the president and approved by the Senate. Rakoff is one of those judges. And so Rakoff's decisions have been much more critical of Picard than a lot of the typical bankruptcy court decisions. So the, the really smart litigants early on realized, I need to do everything I can to get out of the bankruptcy context into an Article III court and make these arguments. Because in the bankruptcy context, too many of the trustees, the judges, and the bankruptcy practitioners fall into this sort of bankruptcy mindset, um, where a judge looking at issues for the first time and not in that mindset oftentimes comes to a different conclusion. And Rakoff, this was a critical one, because if the burden is on the trustee to allege lack of good faith, um, it makes it a lot harder uh, for Picard and for the estate to sue some of these individuals. So this was a critical, critical decision in the, in the Madoff chain that came down about a year ago. Um, we saw another one about a year ago, uh, and this was just a, a Supreme Court denying cert, essentially, but um, what's important about the HSBC decision of almost a year ago is that it made it clear that the SIPA trustee can only bring bankruptcy-related claims, not common law claims against the various players and banks. So this really, as a practical matter, this really limited Picard to clawback-type claims. You can't bring common law you know, uh, breach of fiduciary duty, breach of contract type claims. Um, oops, let me go back, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, and so we are limited, so if you look at these complaints that Picard has filed and continues to litigate and to settle, they're clawback claims. And that's what we're gonna continue to see. We're not gonna have common law claims brought by the SIPA trustee. Um, Fairfield Greenwich. Um, this one was interesting only in that and this was a string of losses you know, within the last year that, that sort of have hit the estate. In this particular case, uh, Picard was trying to enjoin a settlement, um, which in reality had nothing to do with the estate, but he argued they were fraudulent conveyance claims in disguise. What happened is a bunch of investors brought claims against Fearfield Greenwich. There are folks, again, in the audience who know this case a lot better than I do, um, and for other alleged wrongdoing. Uh, the bankruptcy code automatic state provisions should only and do only apply to property of the Madoff estate and to lawsuits that name Madoff or, or um, BLMIS as a party. <clears throat> what the court did was reject Picard's claim that the actions were a fraudulent, fraudulent conveyance claim in disguise. What he wanted to do was say, you know, individuals and investors suing a fund really should not be allowed to go forward because at the end of the day, those assets that those investors are recover should go into the broader pool of Madoff um, recoveries and then distributed among all of the Madoff players. And the court said no. The court said absolutely not. Investors and individuals can bring those claims and they are not subject to the jurisdiction of the, 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 the trustee or the bankruptcy court. And so critical because 
it, 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 it didn't open the door to investor claims. The door had been opened long before and they were being brought, but it made it clear that the economic incentive and the economic interest of those investors doesn't get wrapped up in the entire Madoff um, uh, estate. So this particular case was important because I think it was probably an overreach by Picard, but folks at one point were concerned that if they brought these types of claims, that Picard would step in and all of their hard work would essentially be undone because the assets recovered would go back to the estate and not to the harmed investors. Um, coming up towards our, our end, we're getting closer in time. Uh, Chris versus Farnham Place. Um, <laughs> This was a tough one <laughs> for a lot of folks in the room I know. Um, let's talk for a minute uh, about, as a practical matter, how the offshore funds, um, especially feeder funds, got caught up in, in, in some of these claims and in Madoff. So, and I've got at least three or four clients that were in this position. You've got an offshore feeder fund. For, purposes of this talk, we'll say 100% of the assets were invested in Madoff. Um, obviously, Madoff blows up. At that point, the feeder fund is insolvent. Uh, goes into liquidation offshore. Fund and fund investors say, we're victims. We lost $300 million. Picard comes along and says, I'm sorry you're a victim, but I'm going to sue you. And I'm going to sue you for an additional 200 million because, yeah, you, th you thought you lost 300 million, but that was just paper phantom profits. You actually took 200 million out, which you shouldn't have. You're a net winner, and therefore I'm suing you. Uh, the, the, the look on the you know, investors' faces when you tell them this just tells it all, right? I mean, I don't care if you're an institution, I don't care if you're a fund, I don't care if you're an individual. When you think you're a victim and have lost a ton of money and someone turns around and sues you because they think that you've gotten more out than you should have, you're not in a good place. So what a lot of the offshore, the offshore funds were put in a really bad position, as many of the folks here know. They had no money, they had a lawsuit pending, and they had no way to recover any assets because the guy that was in charge of recovering assets, Irving Picard, was suing them. And the investors wanted their money back, but, the, but they certainly didn't want to get pulled into the U.S. jurisdictional orbit. You know, you've got offshore funds, a lot of the in investors in those funds are sitting in Europe or elsewhere. So what did they do? Well, they, 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 a bunch of smart lawyers came up with a strategy, which is, gee, we've got Picard who's wearing two hats. He's the bankruptcy trustee, and he's also the SIPR administrator. And so what happened in a bunch of these funds, as folks know, is they would settle the clawback claims for a number. And in, in conjunction with that, Picard would allow a SIPA claim for the fund. And in the, and in the right circumstances, the amount you're paying to Picard is less than the amount that you're getting back from SIPA. And then, because nobody wanted to wait around for SIPA, a third-party market developed in the, the buying and selling of SIPA claims. I love, I, by the way, I love, I love Wall Street folks. I mean, you know, they could make money off of anything. I'm definitely in the wrong business. I mean, who, who would have thought, seriously, that there would be a third-party market years ago in, in SIPA claims? I mean, um, you know, we actually negotiated, you know, one of the first SIPA, <laughs> SIPA sale agreements, I mean, purchase and sale agreements. I mean, it's, it's an amazing world sometimes. But, the point of this is all to say is, so now you had, you went from being an insolvent fund with a lawsuit against you, to being a fund that has settled your lawsuit, received your SIPA claim, sold your SIPA claim to another party, and instead of being, instead of being out hundreds of millions of dollars and subject to a lawsuit, you suddenly have money in the door you can distribute to your investors. It was fantastic. Um, but what happened? People do get greedy. It's the one rule of life, right? Over time, the value of the SIPA claims kept rising. Because I said earlier, Picard was phenomenally successful. What does that mean? As he's more successful, more money comes into the estate. As more money comes into the estate, the value of the SIPA claims rise. So, and I'm just gonna use random numbers for a minute, but maybe you sold your SIPA claim for 20 cents on the dollar. And maybe two or three years later, that same SIPA claim is now selling for 50 cents on the dollar. Well, <laughs> obviously you can see where this goes. You start to get requests from folks, especially LC members who are always, you know, nudging. Why, well, can't we undo this? Now, 
no, no offshore judge, um, I, I, certainly in the likes of a judge, if you think about the Bannisters of the world, and you think about, um, I, I, I won't name all the Cayman judges, but you could just think of it, they're not gonna undo a deal. You entered into a commercial transaction, you live and die with the results of that commercial transaction. So we sat in this world for a little while until somebody figured out how to undo the deal, undo some of these deals. And what happened is, the argument was made that the sale of the SIPA claim in a foreign liquidation recognized under Chapter 15 <laughs> is a transfer of an interest to the debtor in property that, it was, that is within the territorial jurisdiction of the United States. Because the SIPA claim is properly located in the United States, its sale is subject to the same level of review, and I won't bore everyone, Section 363 of the Bankruptcy Code, meaning the Bankruptcy Code has to affirm the sale of the interest based in part upon the availability of a good business reason to do so. Okay, what does all that mean? It means that the bankruptcy court gets to decide whether this is a reasonable transaction and whether it's a good business, re whether you enter into it in a good business reason. It gave some of these funds a reason and a hook to undo some of the SIPA sales that they had previously entered into. It's brilliant. It really is brilliant, right? Now, <laughs> what's that? Yeah, <laughs> brilliant. Now. Here's the, people get too caught up in this. First of all, you have to have had a Chapter 15 because it's only if you have filed a Chapter 15 proceeding that the, the, the asset would be located in the United States. So I've done a lot of these sales for, for clients that never had a Chapter 15 proceeding filed and they immediately called me up and said, we can undo all of our SIPA, all, we can do, undo all of these sales. No, you can't undo the sales. You didn't file a Chapter 15. And even if you had, there's a whole host of reasons why it doesn't always work, but we're seeing litigation now that is ancillary to all of these issues, meaning that even in this context, in the Chapter 15 context, people are finding ways to undo deals um, through the use of the bankruptcy court. And there's no way an offshore judge would undo these deals. We've tried. <laughs> um, it's, it was never going to happen. So it's interesting. To, and it doesn't mean the bankruptcy court will undo them either, by the way. It just means the bankruptcy court has the jurisdiction to take a look at them and can disallow them. Uh, and we've seen cases, we've seen instances where the bankruptcy court has disallowed those SIPA sales, and we've seen instances where the bankruptcy court has upheld them. Um, Ida Fishman. Interesting case in that clawback defendants may, be, may have some protection. Um, what's key about this case is that you know, the court upheld a decision dismissing claims against a number of net, net winners. And what matters the most is this language. The court held that the clawback defendants, having every reason to believe that Madoff was actually engaged in the business of affecting securities transactions, have every right to avail themselves of the protections afforded to the clients of stockbrokers, including the protection offered by Section 546E. Basically, what that means is that clients have a right to believe that when they invest with a stockbroker, the stockbroker and the stockbroker sends them statements. They have every reason to believe that that money is being invested in those stocks. Now, people like this decision and they say, "Oh, I can this means I can undo basically any Ponzi scheme." Not so fast. What makes all the Madoff um, issues very very different, of course, is that Madoff was a registered broker dealer here in the United States. We talk a lot about private funds. Madoff was not a private fund. Madoff was subject to all of the regulatory scrutiny of a, as a broker-dealer in the United States. That's why SIPA is even in play. If, if, if Madoff was a private fund, we wouldn't even have SIPA. So this, this decision really can only be used in situations where you do have a registered broker-dealer. But it was critical because it allowed a lot of the investors to put up uh, defenses against Picard's clawback claims, which drove the settlement value of some of these claims down. So what we've seen in a macro sense over the last year to 18 months is that the value of the settlements with Picard have come down. At the same time that the value of the SIPA claims have gone up. So if you were a fund and you could hold out for a few years and you could afford to litigate with Picard, and you held off selling your SIPA claim, you're in a, you'd be in a much better position today than you would have been three years ago. Um, the folks that settled early had some benefits, right? They got out early, their investors got cash back, they got rid of uncertainty, they didn't have to deal with, with litigation. But if you had a crystal ball, 
the better play, if you had the assets to do it, may have been to play it out for a bit. Because a lot of these decisions, this one included, have hurt Picard's ability to bring clawback claims. And in fact, some would argue that really only the two-year look back is, 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 is where we are today. He's still settling cases, and he just settled one, a couple just last week, um, that go beyond that. But it's getting harder and harder as the litigation matures and as these cases come down from the Southern District and the Second Circuit, it's getting harder and harder for Picard to actually continue to press a really hard settlement strategy if you're willing to go to trial with the case. So the settlement numbers have been coming down as an overall percentage, and the SIPA numbers have been going up given the amount that's come into the estate. And it's a trend, and I think it's a trend that'll probably continue. I mean, I have argued and, and, and I've written that I, I think we're seeing the tail end of some of the Madoff recoveries in this sense, because um, there is a limited return. You know, you can, you know I, I understand, I, I took a lot of heat because I made a comment about the legal fees playing into this in one of my articles, but the reality is, forget who's paying the legal fees, whether it's SIPA, whether it's the government, whether it's the individual investors, whether it's the beneficial owners, at the end of the day, you can, only, you can only justify investing a dollar in legal fees if you're going to get more than a dollar in recovery. And if you're at the point of diminishing returns, you will hit that point of equilibrium. <laughs> I feel like Porky Pig. Equilibrium. <laughs> um, and, and it's going to stop. So I think we're coming, I think we're starting to see the end of a lot of the made off. Um, cases, and I think we're starting to see, you know, the, the ceiling of where the recoveries are going to be. Um, lastly, or not so lastly, we're getting close, you know, just, just examples, and this is recent, you know, big settlements are still coming in, and were coming in even last year, um, um, into the Madoff estate. You know, the f almost five, half a billion dollar settlement with Herald Fund, which in, in Premio, which a lot of folks know about. You know, even smaller ones, 95 million with Senator Fund, and then even as little as 1.3 million with Westport National. But money is still coming in. But again, these, these are settlements and cases that have been winding their way through the courts now for years. You know, I don't think we're going to see these types of settlements going forward. Uh, and the last case I want to chat about is uh, another Fairfield, Fairfield Greenwich case. And, and this is the service providers. Uh, has nothing to do with Picard. But the case I showed you earlier, where it became clear that it was acceptable and okay for investors to go after the funds directly, and those funds would not be wrapped up into the estate, this is important. This is one of those cases where this, this money and this would go right back to the investors. And we saw this, by the way, for those of you familiar with the JP Morgan um, settlement. Uh, there was a huge JP Morgan settlement, and that money went back to the investors and made off as well. This is another example, very recent, uh, where the court just certified a class of shareholders in Fairfield Greenwich with respect to claims against a bunch of entities, the most famous being Citgo and PwC. As many of you know, Citgo um, is, a, is an administrator that gets involved in a lot of these funds. PwC has been auditing a ton of this work. And so this will be an interesting one, because to date, the service providers have fought to the, to, the, to the death over these claims. And the problem is there's simply so much at stake that it's hard to settle some of these claims. You know, it's one thing for a JP Morgan caught up in this one particular area to do it. It's another thing for a CITGO um, that maybe the administrator and a whole bunch of troubled funds to start settling. But this is the next wave that we're seeing outside of the Madoff estate, but obviously related to Madoff uh, against third party um, service providers. Okay, so moving forward, what are we going to what are we going to see? Uh, the first we've talked about is the relevant relevant application of U.S. law. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's similar. What a lot of courts will do is they'll say, "I don't, I can't figure out Cayman law," but I think it's similar enough to U.S. law that I'll apply U.S. law and assume it's close enough. Uh, we've seen that a bunch of times. There aren't even really it's not even a reported decision that'll say that. But if you've litigated these cases, you're in front of the judge. You know, motion to dismiss is filed. Court might have affidavits from Cayman lawyers that go to the ceiling, doesn't dig in, just says, eh, we'll see how it plays out. But let's see how it plays out, denied without prejudice means what? It means you get discovery. And we'll talk about discovery in a second, but it's close enough, at least in some U.S. judge's mind, the U.S. law to foreign law that they're allowed to go forward. Jurisdiction is going to be a huge issue. I won't get into all the specifics on jurisdiction. The one thing I did want to talk about on jurisdiction um, are the U.S. banking system um, 
issue. It's the continuous and systemic course of conduct. We've seen a raft of cases where litigants have argued that a use of the United States banking system um, results in jurisdiction in the United States. And so you may have a situation where a French bank invests in an offshore fund and there is a loss. And suddenly that French bank is sued in New York City. And French bank says, I don't know what this case is about, but I never touched New York City. I was invested in an offshore fund. It wasn't even invested in assets in the US. There's no jurisdiction. And what plaintiffs have argued is that basically a clearing bank in New York would have touched the money that flowed through that, that fund. And once the clearing bank touched it, you, you have purposely availed yourself of the United States banking system and therefore you're subject to jurisdiction. Scary argument, but it's worked in a lot of cases. There's new case law on that topic, but if you can show a systemic and continued use of banks and clearing banks in New York, you can oftentimes grab jurisdiction in New York and it makes a big difference because regardless of what law is being applied in these cases, United States procedural law is always applied if the case is here. That means, and we'll get into it, that means lower pleading standards, notice pleading. It means amazing amounts of discovery compared to the offshore jurisdiction. It means you know everybody covers their own legal fees instead of the losing party pays system offshore. So there is a rush to try to get cases into New York that really have nothing to do with the United States on the theory that you've availed yourself of the United States banking system. The other big issue I think we see going forward these days is funding. Um, we've seen it onshore a lot. There have always been ways in which onshore um, cases have been funded. Lawyers have contingency fee agreements. Litigation funders have been, have been involved in the U.S. for years. I think the sea change I've seen is, with the, uh, is the, the pervasiveness of the litigation funders offshore. You know, in the U.S., we go to law school, we don't really know what champerty is. Um, we don't know what maintenance is. I, I, I joke, I know what they are. I almost can't tell you the difference between the two. <laughs> we just lump them together, right? Um, as a practical matter, for whatever reason, the, there is a, a lessening of the sort of champerty and maintenance rules to the point where you know, the, off, the onshore litigation funders are able to fund litigation by offshore liquidators and litigation in the US. Um, and I think the, the argument has been, this is, since it's not being brought offshore, it's being brought in the US, it should be allowed. So we're gonna see more and more and more of that. It gives the liquidators yet another way to pursue claims without using either limited resources left in the liquidated estate or, um, in some cases, the no resources <laughs> available in, in the liquidation. Um, cost is a big issue. Obviously, onshore, everybody pays their own fees for the most part. Offshore, it's loser party pays. As somebody who's been in both jurisdictions, I can tell you one of the biggest frustrations I have with offshore, meaning Cayman or BVI cases and litigation, is the, the, the fight ends up being not so much about the disputed issue. It becomes about who's gonna pay everybody's fees for every single piece of paper that's filed in the case. And it, it, it's, it's, it's the, it is the proverbial tail wagging the dog, right? Enough, we've been fighting now. You, know, you have a 10 minute hearing on a motion and then you've got an hour of who should pay whose fees because of it. Um, you don't have that in the U.S. Now granted, there are issues in the U.S. which is you might have to pay a lot of money to recover something that's rightfully yours. They're just different systems and depending on the situation you're in, one system may be better or not, but you have to know about them and make an informed choice. Um, pleading issues are big. I joked around before, but you know, with some folks here, you know, the difference in the U.S. is the pleading standards except for fraud are very, very loose. And even fraud standards are loose compared to offshore. You know, I can basically say, upon information and belief, you're a fraudster. <laughs> you know, I don't have to have any information or any belief as a practical matter, but I can allege it, and if I can get it to stick, at least at the beginning of a case, I can get discovery and I can prove it. Obviously not the case offshore. So big, big distinction there. Um, discovery, we talked a little about this, but incredibly broad. Uh, in the United States compared to what's available elsewhere. Not surprising that a lot of folks want to bring uh, l cases in the U.S. just to get discovery. Um, I, I don't want to get into imperi delecto very much, just to say of it's the one issue where I would say beware in the U.S. Um, it's the one area where, particularly in New York, uh, courts have been very, uh, very focused in applying, in, in applying the imperi delecto 
um, doctrine, which basically means the wrongdoer can't benefit from his or her own acts. And in these cases, when you think of if you're an offshore liquidator, you are stepping into the shoes of the fund and the fund manager. And so what some courts, what New York says is if you're simply stepping into those shoes, the fund or the fund manager was the wrongdoer and therefore can't benefit. Now, we can get around it, <laughs> we can plead around it, but you have to know about it and you have to build it into your analysis if you're gonna bring suit in the US. It's probably the biggest bar to bringing uh, claims in the US that deal with fraudulent type funds. Um, just a quick benefit of US litigation compared to offshore. We talked about pleading, we talked about discovery, we talked about legal fees, uh, we talked about liberal and expansive application of the law, off contract claims. You know, a lot of times you may not have a pure breach of contract claim, especially in the fund context, because the agreement says the manager can pretty much do whatever he or she wants. But here we can come up with breach of fiduciary duty claims. We can come up with um, breach of the co co implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing claims. We can come up with misrepresentation, uh, negligent and intentional misrepresentation and fraud claims. So there's more opportunity in the U.S. to go off contract. <laughs> jury trials. It surprises a lot of my offshore friends that yes, you can have a jury trial in the United States on these claims. And, and we have one, I have one going to trial in July. Um, you know, it, it, it's not a fun place for a fraudster or an offshore fund manager to be sitting in front of a jury uh, in New York or New Jersey or Connecticut um, arguing that the billions of dollars he or she stole was perfectly allowed for by the agreement. You know, it, it, key difference between here and there. Um, we talked about the New York banking system um, and beware and peri delecto. Let me just say that our goal here, and I'll wrap up in a minute, is uh, not only cash, we talked about this. What we can do and have done in the United States and offshore as well is use these concepts in, in litigation and the threat of litigation to get enhanced liquidity, to reduce a defer manager compensation, to get an independent valuation firm in to see what's really going on to negotiate a liquidation plan, to get redemptions in kind, which sometimes work for sophisticated institutional investors, and sometimes don't, but sometimes do. Uh, we can get control of the fund, and we can get, we can discharge, if, if, I'm, if I'm an institution, I may have to do some of this just to discharge my fiduciary duties to my investors. I mean, some of the scariest calls I get is, you know, institutions who are, benef who, who are essentially have their own beneficiaries saying, I'm a fiduciary, I don't know what to do. And what I've said is, okay, the one thing you can't do is stick your head in the sand. <laughs> you know, you have to at least discharge some independent duty and that might mean an investigation. Um, these are just things for liquidators who are in the room to consider, you know, understanding that the offshore court still supervises litigation in the US. And as a practical matter, the LC will drive you crazy, as you know. So every action you take uh, will be subject to scrutiny. Um, you still have a duty to act fairly. Um, you still have to get sanctioned to do the stuff you want to do, including bring uh, cases in the US. You have to think about the fee issues we've talked about. How are you going to pay the, the onshore professionals? Is there going to be a litigation funder involved? Is there some type of contingency component? Is there, uh, is there enough allocated? to handle the legal fees. The worst thing that can happen is in the middle of a case say, we don't have enough money to pay you anymore. Um, you know, one thing we've done, or I've done, on the fee issue is, and it works in some instances, is start to think about fixed fees. Um, because, you know, it, it, it's not fun when you have to keep submitting fee requests and going before the court and get your fee requests approved offshore when the LC is constantly complaining about every little entry on the bill. A better way to do it sometimes is to say, you know, we will handle the diligence phase and the filing of the complaint for X dollars. We will handle discovery for Y dollars, we will handle pretrial motions for Z dollars, and we will take it to trial for this amount. Uh, and the benefit of that, if you put it in a plan and it's locked in, is that the liquidator can put that plan in front of the court and the LC, and once it's approved, you don't have to keep going back. It's approved. Now, the law firm takes a risk, but has some skin in the game, right? There's, on the one hand, you might get a premium. The case could settle early and you get a premium. On the other hand, if the case goes the distance and you're wrong about your assumptions, it may very well be that the, the, the liquidator on the offshore fund is, does quite well, given the amount at stake. But I've found over the years that sometimes it's less about the dollar value than about the certainty 
of what's going to be spent in any particular matter. Um, two other uh, points, we talked about chapter 15, don't forget it's a tool and it's an alternative to, to uh, pure litigation in some respects. It, it can get you access to the US courts, it can be a useful tool and it's a placeholder. Um, we talked a lot about chapter 15. The thing about chapter 15, and I'm gonna talk about uh, the next issue now, is chapter 15 can be a little bit of a um, sort of a shotgun approach, right? It's, it's a broad net. Once you have a chapter 15, it opens up all kinds of issues, both good and bad, jurisdictional wise in the US. The thing that a lot of folks don't focus on, and I've done a bunch of them, are section 1782 petitions. If, if, if a chapter 15 filing is the, um, you know, is the um, uh, uh, shotgun blast, you know, a section 1782 is the sniper rifle. You know, it's very, very narrow and very specific. It's not well known, but it provides access to discovery without litigation. And it's an effective tool for a liquidator. And what we do is we file a petition in a court, um, uh, a U.S. District Court, and we say there are documents in the United States that we want access to, or there are people in the United States that we would like to depose. And we are, um, I'll go back and I went before, you know, oops, there we go, sorry about that. So the person from whom discovery has to reside in the jurisdiction, that's easy, or the documents have to reside there. The discovery must be for use in a proceeding before a foreign tribunal. Well, we've successfully argued that an offshore liquidation is a foreign tribunal and that the documents are gonna be used in that tribunal. And these are documents you could never get um, you know, in, a, in a BVI or a Cayman proceeding or certainly deposition testimony. And the application must be made by an interested person, which in this case would be a liquidator. So we can meet each of these standards. And what the court does is consider these four discretionary factors, which typically we can easily meet. Um, the documents and testimony are within the foreign tribunal's ju jurisdictional reach. Well, <laughs> if we could get the documents and testimony from the Cayman Court or the BVI Court, we wouldn't be doing this. So that's an easy one to meet, right? Um, the foreign court of government would be receptive to US federal court assistance. Typically they are. Um, I don't see Judge Bannister here this year. He might not be, but most, peop most of them are. Um, this request has to, you know, it can't conceal an attempt to circumvent uh, a restriction. So if there's a document that a foreign court would consider absolutely privileged and confidential, and the only reason you're doing this in the U.S. is to get access to something you're affirmatively not allowed to have access to, that would be different. But here that's usually not the case. Uh, and the subpoena can't be unduly intrusive or burdensome, but that's the standard we live with in the U.S. for discovery anyway. Everything is bur burdensome and intrusive. <laughs> you know, it's all relative. Um, but what Section 1782 allows us to do is to get information and documents and testimony that we can then both use in an offshore liquidation and then also use in other actions that the fund may bring. You know, you may have a, a Cayman-based fund um, that wants to bring litigation against you know, uh, PwC Bermuda. And it intends to file a, an action in Bermuda, but it knows that documents related to that claim are resident at PwC in New York. And so you can file a 1782 application, obtain the documents from PwC in New York, and then use them as an offshore liquidator in suing PwC in Bermuda. And we've been successful in doing that. It's a very powerful, narrow tool, and it doesn't open you up to jurisdiction issues the way Chapter 15 does. All right, so takeaways. Um, large recoveries, great discovery, uh, stigma of litigation is worn away, uh, and in a lot of times the U.S. can provide a good forum because the liable parties are often here, even if the funds are domiciled offshore, the legal system is more flexible, and usually the fund assets have some nexus to the United States. I've got five minutes early. I'm very proud of myself. So, questions? Yep. Have you actually seen any litigation in respect of the, uh, the so-called metal victims funds and how that uh, uh, works in with um, you know, distributions that may have liquidation by the large funds? We haven't seen litigation. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think how to put this. So I, I've, I had lunch with Picard about a year ago, and we talked about 
the victim fund. It wasn't just with Picard, it was a larger group. But we talked about the victim fund. And I think that there is a real um, fundamental disagreement between uh, the SIPA trust, the SIPA administrator, bankruptcy trustee Picard in this case, and the, and the, the Madoff Victim Fund. Uh, I don't want to speak for him, but I think, although it would have been an additional headache, I think Picard probably would have liked to have administered the Victim Fund, because at least the administration of the Victim Fund and the administration of the SIPA estate would have been coterminous and, and uh, aligned. And so what we're seeing is, uh, especially the feeder funds, and, and you know any type of fund really that was invested into Madoff, they're getting their SIPA claims allowed, they're seeing recoveries, there's more money to be found by way of the victim fund, and they're being blocked. And they're being blocked not really for any statutory reason, but because the, the Madoff victim fund administrator has said, we just don't like you. <laughs> we don't like, we, we're, not, we're, not he we're here to help widows and orphans and children, we're not here to help offshore feeder funds. But the reality is the only way you're ever going to get the money to the widows and orphans and children are going to be through those feeder funds because it flows down. So, I, I mean, I've got a number of clients who, and I, my recommendation was always the same. They've said, do not submit a claim. For all of my feeder fund and other fund clients, we submitted claims. <laughs> Let them deny the claim. Let's see how it plays out. Uh, I believe that somebody will start taking the, the, the step once, once they're affirmatively told or once money starts flowing and they're not getting it, there will be litigation over that issue. I can't tell you how it'll play out, but from a fundamental fairness standpoint, it does seem wrong that you know, if you were a direct investor in Madoff, it shouldn't matter who you were or what type of structure you had. You were the investor, you lost the money. And as a practical matter, an Irish bank that's invested in a Cayman fund is not gonna bring a direct claim in the victim fund. It's just not. Yep. Yeah. So the way it works is you file a petition. You have to start by filing a petition with the court that says this is who I am, this is, how it, this is why it's being brought. Um, you can ask for two things. You can ask for documents and you can ask for testimony. You can get, if the court approves your application, meaning the court says, yes, I believe you meet all the tests we talked about, then you, 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 you submit your document request through, by way of a subpoena to the other side. Even though you've already, you, even though you've already attached your document request to the court, there's, an interme there's a second step where you then send the document request out again to the other party. Because sometimes, here's the thing, Section 1782 applications are designed to be ex parte. Uh, as a practical matter, as a practical, sorry. As a practical matter, they really, they rarely So they get two bites of the apple. They get the first bite to say there shouldn't be any uh, relief under 17 years. Then they get a second bite to say that these document requests are overbroad. But once you beat back both of those challenges, they have to produce the documents. Um, now, when you say the admissible form, um, they can come by way of, it depends on where they're coming from, but they could come by way of the people the records out there. Uh, if they don't, and you need testimony to authenticate them in the foreign tribunal, you can then ask for a deposition testimony from a keeper of the records or a person knowledge of the list of documents, and you can ask the questions necessary to authenticate the documents. And then you have the um, uh, testimony under oath and the documents to use later. My experience has been as a practical matter, most of the folks who want 782, they don't really care about authenticating, they just need access to the actual documents. And then if we have testimony, it's more about actual deposition testimony about the facts underlying the issue necessarily about the audience. Yeah. Do, you, um, do you think it's possible to overcome US ideas with the current veto by exporting a Kenyan law via Chapter 15 to the US courts? And obviously we'll then look at the, consider how encouraged in terms of the code is considered in the Cayman, or you hope it would be considered by the US judge. <laughs> Do you want a yes or no to that? Yeah, I would, <laughs> I would say it, 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 yes, it, it's possible. Yeah. Um, the problem is, this is where you, you, you really run into trouble. Though. Um, if you're going to argue to a US
U.S. judge that Cayman law applies, and therefore the you know imperial delecto should be applied, the Cayman equivalent thereof should be applied. Well, then it's very difficult to turn around and tell the judge to ignore Cayman law on the substance of the dispute because you're probably going to get tossed under Cayman law because the agreement says that the fund manager can do whatever he or she has done. So it's a, it's a dicey argument. I mean, typically when we get in front of a U.S. judge, they're trying to argue that some U.S. law should apply, whether it's fraud. You know, the argument would be that the you know, New York fraud law should apply. If we're going to do that, we have to live with and carry the life belt. So yes, you can do it, but sometimes it's not the best move if you want to win the law. But everybody else except Mike Sabbath is asleep. So, folks, thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions after, I'll be at lunch. And uh, I really appreciate you coming. I know it's a long time to see you in uh, I tried to recruit a number of people to come join me, and they all declined. So, thank you for listening, and have a great rest of your week.